I'm Rob LaCuria, Senior Editor at Gold Derby with Marie Kreutzer, Writer, Director of the period drama Corsage. Marie, I'm fascinated with um, the title of the film. I mean, I have my own ideas as to why you decided to call it Corsage, but what is that meant to uh, represent thematically? Um, well, it's uh, just a more beautiful word for the corset, and uh, I chose it because the corset is, is such a big um, symbolic part of the film also when it comes to um, how this woman is, is living in, in a cage, basically, and is, um, yeah, is, is laced up every day. So <laughs> um, it was just a, a, good, a, good, a good image and a good symbol. Yeah, um, I mean, one of the first things we see in the film is... Um, Elizabeth, you know, the Empress, being really tightly woven into this uh, whalebone corset, corsage type situation. And uh, that is how she's feeling, not only physically, but emotionally. Uh, and uh, and I, I love that. That's a really great way for us to start the film because it made me feel so uncomfortable. It made mm. me feel like I wanted to break free. And so when you're doing that, is that... Um, is how how do you feel about the uh the film being told called people are saying that it's a reflection on a woman's worth and agency in this particular period given that she it's like she doesn't really have much of a choice at all when we first start the film mm. Yeah, I mean, th that's that's very obvious that she's just uh, she doesn't have a choice. That's also why I chose this ending because there's really, um there's not many opportunities for a woman in her role and her time um but still uh, I wouldn't have done the film if it was not uh, a universe story about womanhood and um how women and girls are still raised by society to please uh, in order to be loved that's just um something we all deal with on a daily basis and it's it's bigger than our individual bringing up upbringing you know it's i i was raised by a true and strong feminist and still i always try to be kind and pretty and everything just because that's what society tells us to do and that's what um that's that's yeah being pleasing is really our way to to be loved and also to get what we want to get and that's so sad I think and that's what the film is about yeah I, I also really appreciated the way that this film is quite timeless um obviously it's set in 1877 um, but there are so many uh nuances that you have put into the film's look and feel to give it a more contemporary uh feel as well um so you you subvert our expectations on what a luscious period drama is supposed to sound and look like. Um, so how much do you do you enjoy uh, peppering in those anachronisms to peel back the artifice of what the 1800s would have looked like and give us something that's a little bit more relatable, I suppose, to what we're feeling today? Well, this is something that um, developed as we went, you know, with the other creators, with my um, production designer, costume designer, DOP. Um, there were some uh, there were some modern elements already in the script. For example, the music, most of the songs were already in the script. And um, I discussed them quite early in the financing process. I was asked frequently, um, what, what is that modern, modern music? What does it have to do there? Um, and uh, so I had to come up with good answers quite early. And um, this is uh, most artistic decisions um, are very intuitive. And I couldn't really explain it at that time. It's just that I didn't want it to be a classic period film with a classic period score. And I always prefer songs in films. But this is really where it started. And then we were discussing the rooms and the costumes and everything that was really original. I didn't like so much because it was very decorated and very heavy and I didn't I didn't want to reproduce the images we have from other period films I, I wanted to do something else and something more simple and focused on um on the silhouettes more costume wise and also on the on the shape of furniture more than on you know all this yeah decoration and kitsch and gold and and velvet and silk you would see in every other period film and I wanted to also create a very a quite dark atmosphere because when I was doing the research I was in the uh, apartments of Sissi a lot which are very close to my home uh, and it's interesting because they're 
uh, very big spaces, very beautiful. Uh, but you, when you look out of the window, you always look into gray yards because the Vienna Hofburg is a complex of many buildings and it ha has all these gray yards and you only, only see other walls. And it's like really, it's more like a jail than a, than in a castle. And that was something I wanted that really inspired, um, was the original inspiration for the look and feel of the film. Um, a, a, an elegant car, an elegant jail, <laughs> so to yeah. speak. An yeah, jail. I love that because when I watch the film, when, look, period drama, even ones that take narrative liberties like Corsage, can be so difficult to get right because it so, so much rides on the look and feel of the film. Uh, mm. In terms of cinematic spectacle and also some degree of historical authenticity, it, perhaps. Um, and so you're not doing Marie Antoinette or like Dickinson where we're hearing hip hop and where we're where they're speaking like teenagers or whatever from the 1980s. We are, the, it is just so subtle and it, um, it gave me this sense of unease and that's how I started the film. I felt very uneasy for her and, uh, and then it started to open up as she starts to realise I don't need to... I have choices. I'm going to go to London. I'm going to go to Bavaria, whatever it may be. And so, sorry, that's a very long-winded question. My point <laughs> is, is that, was there ever it. a tendency for you to want to pull back from that stuff? Or were you, as the film progressed, you felt more emboldened to take the film into more bold areas? Well, I think I'm I'm always kind of bold in my artistic decisions because I never really think uh, about if people will like it or not, because you can ne not plan that anyway. I've learned that <laughs> you can you can only do the film you would like to see. That's all you can do, and you just have to stay true to that vision you have. And then people will like it or not, and some will like it and others not. It's it's just um, the success that this film now has is not planable or predictable. It's just it, it, I'm lucky, you know. But it's uh, it could have turned out otherwise. I, I just didn't know, of course. Um, but I, I had my own ideas and I had my own vision. And then, as I said, as we got along, as we as we worked on it together with the other creatives, more and more ideas came up. And it was really, uh, it started being really playful, you know, to to um, to use elements from other times and to uh, uh, integrate them uh, in that way that we wanted to be subtle, uh, but sometimes we would go a little further and then not. And it was just like, making this of course I'm making decisions every day on set anyway but it was also that was also a part of the decision making is this too much is this um too boring is it you know um and I cannot I mean I cannot I, I can just say it wouldn't um it wouldn't feel like this if it wasn't for all the other creatives as well because it really became our kind of game to come up with ideas and and create that that look and atmosphere and um I don't know if that answers your question. It really does. It does. <laughs> Sorry. I, I love it. Um, there's this moment in the film um, pretty early on where Elizabeth says um, in voiceover, at the age of 40, a person begins to disperse and fade, darkening like a cloud. And I think it's her. And uh, this is superimposed over this silhouette of her. And I mm. love that. That's when I, that's when you, that's when you hooked me. Because mm -hmm. a lot of people would say in your 40s, it's the reverse. But this is mm -hmm. how she's feeling. It's pivotal because she's restless and dissatisfied. And it's a turning point. She's turning 40. You know, this is sissy turning 40. It's a big deal. So mm -hmm. why was that important for you to really ram that home for the audience? Hey, this is where she's at in her mind. But she's not necessarily going down that path. This sentence is an original quote. She wrote that herself. Uh, and when I read it, I knew that it would begin with her turning 40. I didn't know that before. I was doing all my research and working on the script. But when I read this, I know this had to be the beginning. And um, I also love the sentence and, and, you know, combining it with that image of her statue and with, with the music. And I also love that moment. And I'm glad you brought it up. I'm happy you 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 saw it and, and you it, it had that meaning for you, too. Um, yeah, it's really when she realizes that um, trying to please and trying to to meet all these expectations and doing the right things all the time um, will not be enough anymore. And does she even want that? You know, is isn't there maybe another way to go? 
Um, but and I and I think it would have been very boring to just decide that she would try not to age, you know. Mm. Um, that's of course something we see frequently these days. <laughs> yeah. But um, it doesn't work one way or the other. I mean, women in the public eye either they age naturally, and people talk about hate how they turned old, or they uh, let a lot of stuff being done to their face, and people talk about that. So it's. It, you you can only go wrong either way, um, which is also something I could talk about for hours because I think it's so brutal um, to women. Um, but in this case, I um, and in in her time and in, I mean, when when you turn forty uh, in the late nineteenth century, you were certainly just an old woman. You were she was a grandmother already yeah. um, in real life at that time and it was clear that she she was only but what 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 did that mean I mean if if your entire role was to be the young beautiful empress and if people loved you for that uh, what would they love you for if you refused um, to play that role anymore and that was yeah that was the thought yeah that double standard is horrifying that mm. Um, I can just keep aging my hair will go gray and people will think oh that's wonderful but as a, if you're a woman it's a completely different story and uh mm. I don't think that we're ever going to get past that um yeah know, I'm, I'm afraid we won't <laughs> probably not and that's why we I mean films like this are a great way to just kind of maybe open our eyes a little more but it's just entrenched in our society mm. um, globally um I saw the film also through the prism of how society worships and adulates celebrity royalty uh, it's been doing so for centuries. Um, Elizabeth was idolized and idealized as an influencer. So how much of that theme played a part in bringing the story to life? Because obviously that is now such a huge part of our society today. Yeah. I mean, Vicky Krebs always said um, uh, that she thinks Sissy was the first victim of celebrity culture. Mm. Um, and it was really, I, I read, um, that's the great thing, about the internet you can find everything and I found the, all the newspapers from that year online you can read all of the Viennese newspapers wow. and it's really like reading um, like some magazine today and how they're analyzing what Meghan Markle was doing it's really the same thing they are discussing whether she gained weight um, whether she was sick because she didn't turn up to this or that event so it's really it hasn't changed a bit you know so I think um, all the expectations upon women are even worse when you are in the public eye. And then even worse if you're in royalty, because these women or these people in general, they are not only being judged by the public, but also by their own system. Mm -hmm. They have to, they have so many rules. Um, when I was writing the script, I was really then reading some articles about Meghan Markle because I because I saw her on every magazine cover and every headline was judging her for doing something wrong and then I read a little bit about her and I I hadn't known that before you when you're not supposed to cross your legs as a woman in in the in the English um, um, royal family uh, and you're not supposed to wear a skirt that is shorter than this or that and wear heels that are higher or lower than this or that so it's there's so many regulations and you can't just you can't just do that without making mistakes and you're judged for everything all the time and you have no freedom. You cannot say what you want. You cannot work. You cannot make your own money. You cannot make any own decisions, basically. Yeah. So, um, I mean, of course, we, we are talking about very wealthy people who uh, don't have to worry about anything uh, their entire lives, but still still I feel for them in a way I mean it's just uh it's just not fun and if you're born into that even more you cannot um there's no there's no way out of that really and I think that's yeah it's just the extreme you know that yeah. uh, there's women yeah. in general there's women in the public and there's women in royalty that's the extreme well but I, I'm, I'm glad we we need to get past you know we get we have this guilt when we when we start to say oh this poor rich celebrity mm. royalty is having a bad but uh, we can still have a commentary about their lot in life and their station in life and also recognize that they're wealthy and they will um, never um, need it for anything in their lives and so I'm glad that you're able to um, separate those two notions I hate it when people say oh Meghan Markle she's rich and she's famous who cares it's like well can you imagine living like that and can you imagine if Sissy had Instagram or the, 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 mm. social media? Imagine social media was a thing back in the 1800s. It would be, it would be horrifying. 
it would be even mm. worse um so this is what makes me made me really excited about the film you go for broke and shatter any pretense of historical artifact in the final act talk me through your desire to reinvent perhaps what history knows about her ultimate fate in the service of the story that you wanted to tell um well I'm I did a lot of research but then in the end you know it's like uh, it's like when I studied film you learn the rules then to you can then you can break them again and um I'm really glad I know so much about her but uh then in the on the other hand what do you know I mean it's all uh every biography you read is an interpretation anyway we were all not there um, and when you read, I read a biography from 1999 and I read one from the 1950s and it's like you're reading about two different women because they they are referring to the same facts, but um, the image of women or of an empress was different at that time and the exp it, it already changed so much that when you read about it, it's, um, uh, yeah, it's, it, it, it's, it always has so much more to do with the person who wrote it and the time it was written in than with the actual story. And that's something I learned very early in the research process, that it's always an interpretation and that we all went out there and that, we, that nobody knows what happened behind clo closed doors anyway. Yeah. So I felt quite free. And then also Sisi is so famous in my country that I knew if I wanted to do it right, there would always be someone telling me I did it wrong. So <laughs> I didn't care for that at all. I, I, it was clear to me I would do my thing. And it was just, it was, it's just a story, you know, it's not like I'm trying to, to tell the truth. Um, but I, what, what, what I did try is to stay true to the, to the woman I read about. And, um, and no matter which biography I read, I, I sensed that she was much more complex difficult you could say and smart than I thought before and you just see the old films or just see the images you think she was a vain um beautiful woman who only cared for her looks and for her horses yeah but of course she cared for a lot of other things but was not allowed to and um yeah and then I'm also trying I'm always trying to show people as as the complex personalities they are we all are you know we, we none of us is always kind um every one of us is sometimes way, vain and that's just how it is and then it's um it's really a thing I think that that in films uh we're used to see not in all films of course there are a lot of other there are a lot of good films who show people in their complexity but in general in the mainstream films you very often see people just the stereotypes they're either good or bad they're either beautiful or ugly they're either nice or unkind it's just not that's just not like it is and right. I always think it's very important to um to try and do that um but but still what always happens when I write a script and people read it for the first time producers and so on they say well it's beautifully written but do you think people will like her and that's what happened with all of my scripts and it's so it has become kind of a mission for me to show complex, especially complex female characters, because even there, we are more, we are kind of with, um, with male characters, you know, they are allowed to do much more <laughs> yeah, evil things and we will still go with them. Of course. Um, but if a, fe if a female character is not the perfect mother, um, that's just a reason enough for people not to like her anymore. And that's, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to fight that. <laughs> that has become a mission. <laughs> yeah, it's that's a bit crazy. Um, so the film premiered in um, Uncertain Regard at Cannes and Vicky uh, won Best Performance. Um, I imagine as a filmmaker, there is some expectation or um, excitement about going to Cannes, for example, or Venice or whatever it may be. Did the whole experience for you um, meet your expectations? What was that like for you as a filmmaker to be out in you know the, the biggest film festival in the world? It was great. I mean, I it was, of course, the ultimate plan and wish to go there with the film. And um, it was really a great experience. It was also very exhausting because I didn't really get to see out of I didn't get to see other films. I didn't get to see a lot of people because I had press all day long. Vicky and me mainly spent the festival in the backyard of our hotel doing press while our crew was drinking champagne <laughs> and celebrating. <laughs> But still, I mean, uh, it was a huge success and, and um, 
it was an unforgettable moment to have the standing ovations there. And I just, yeah, it's just something that I'm going to keep in my heart, but still uh, it was it was to go and I didn't think any further. So everything that happened after that with the film being sold to so many countries and now yeah. travel, now me traveling around and all that and all these people responding to the film so well is 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 just a bonus. You couldn't I couldn't have planned that. And it's um, I really didn't think any further than come, to be honest. Yeah, I can. So imagine. It's, all, it's all gifts now. That's right. Um, so, you know, it's Austria's submission at the uh, Oscars for International Feature. Austria's got such a proud heritage in that category. Her winning mm. the Caterpillars in 2007, Amour in 2012. You're nominated at the European Film Awards. So good luck with all the awards stuff coming. Thank you. I hope we see you on the Oscars red carpet. I hope that, hopefully that happens for you. <laughs> Thank you. I'm not expecting anything now. Everything, as I said, everything is just a bonus now. But I, But I enjoy what happens, so... Thank you. <laughs>